Hi, it's Jan Beta, and I thought I'd do something slightly less ambitious than the last couple of videos I made. Those took an incredible amount of work, as you've probably seen. Here's something that's probably going to be a bit quicker, hopefully still fun to watch and hopefully fun for me. Uh, you probably already know what this video is about from the thumbnail and the video title, so I'm not going to do a lengthy introduction here. Let's just get right into it. So I got lucky on eBay actually, which becomes kind of a rare thing these days because uh, retro is such a huge thing apparently currently and uh, I got this box and it was actually delivered uh, right as it is not very well packaged but it still arrived in one piece and it is a Nintendo Entertainment System and it came with two controllers yeah there's no padding at all please if you ever sell something like this on eBay don't ship it like this I think it was wrapped in plastic and the label was actually on the plastic but otherwise this was how it was shipped and uh, yeah luckily it's completely in one piece there's a piece broken off here but that was uh, damage done previously I think I'm not experienced at all basically with the Nintendo Entertainment System but I always had a thing for it especially since C64 Customs told me about his experience with the Nintendo Entertainment System he did a number of videos about these and did all kinds of mods to his systems my experience basically as a Commodore kid I had a Commodore 64 at the time this was really popular and uh, was a bit envious when I saw people playing Super Mario Brothers on this and stuff like that we only had our Diana sisters <laughs> what I'm going to do today is to take a look inside and refurbish the electronics probably do some cleaning and retro brighting on the case and try to fix this little crack here which I think is doable because it's just a little piece of plastic that broke off and yeah basically check out the system and see if this works at all one other thing I want to point out I got really lucky. I paid like 24 euros, I think, delivered for this. And look at that. It even comes with the cartridge inside. And the cartridge, the cartridge has some of the best games. Super Mario Brothers, I really wanted. Tetris, I really love. Yeah, Nintendo World Cup is not one of my favorites, but I guess it's still a good game. This was actually um, sold together with the NES at times, at least here in Germany. I don't know if it was sold around the world with this card, but this was like packed in with the console. Very nice actually. And these go for, I, I think you can buy these for the price I paid for the whole thing if you're not that lucky. So incredible stroke of luck for me. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, Skillshare. Skillshare is an amazing video and social platform for learning new skills. They cover a variety of topics ranging from everything that you would ever need for your creative work, uh, including video editing. I've learned quite some tricks there already. So I took this class by Nikki Stevens about stock footage, which is something I've never used in my videos, but there are some really useful tips in there and I might utilize some of it for future videos. But you will find many topics covered for everything that has to do with making things. And the first 1000 people who click on the link in my video description get a free trial of Skillshare Premium. And in case you like it and should decide to stay on the platform, it's not even that expensive. It's less than $10 a month with a yearly subscription of Skillshare. So check that out. Back to the Nintendo. This didn't come with the power supply. Fortunately, I already had one actually that I dug out that Anthony, one of my patrons, donated a while back. And I think this is the original power supply. The British version actually it says GBR on here. So it had a UK plug. I just swapped it out with the euro plug that I need here and on the other end it just has this barrel connector that connects to the Nintendo Entertainment System. It's just an AC power supply, 9 volts AC and all the smoothing, rectification and regulation is actually happening in the NES. So we're going to be fine with this actually I think. 
So I don't know if you can see this, this says it's 9 volt AC 1.3 amps, I think. 17 watts. This needs some thorough cleaning as well. I heard people using 12 volt power supplies, uh, DC power supplies and stuff like that. You could probably use a 9 volt power supply, a uh, regular DC power supply because all the rectification happens in the NES and you don't need to feed in AC voltage for that to work, you can also get away with DC voltage. This was sold as untested. I tend to buy stuff like that, so it might be that we have to do some repairs on this. I'm quite tempted actually to just power it on, but I guess I should have a look inside before I do so. So let's do that. So it originally had six screws, I think, two of which seem to be missing already. So maybe somebody was in here. I think this should now just lift off. Yeah. Okay, lots of shielding, as was a thing back then. Oh, there are some, some more screws missing on the back here. There's one missing here. Let's just held on with these. Clearly somebody has been in here. Let's remove the shielding. It seem to be the same screws here. Yeah, these are exactly the same screws. Maybe somebody was in here to clean the cartridge port, which is quite a common thing. Probably embarrassing myself, because I don't know how to go about this. Oh, there's another screw. <laughs> yeah, there we go. That gets rid of this portion. <laughs> yeah, and you need to take that off to clean the cartridge port. The actual port is here and there's this funny locking mechanism. It still works fine on this one, that's pretty cool actually. And the thing to take this whole thing out, we probably have to remove these screws here. Maybe these in the front here. Yeah, that's loose there. We need to probably need to remove these. Yeah, there we go. These screw in from the bottom, I think. And this is screwed on from the top, so we're just... I'm just going to take everything out here. The connectors for the controllers screw in from the bottom. And this part should come out. Oh, okay, the whole assembly comes out. Ah, and these actually come out towards the front. Okay, well that's interesting. Excuse my being a noob here. I think you can pull these out from the PCB when we get that out. So you can uh, remove them through the holes in the front. So there's two screws for this reset and power button assembly. And then that should be it. Take this whole thing out. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and we can actually disconnect the controller ports here, I think. Yes! That's neat, actually. Very nice. And this actually also comes off, I think. Yes. Nice! Ah, this is just clipped on to the cartridge port. And famously, there's not much on here. That's why there are so many clone boards, actually. Bit of logic. Some RAM. This is RAM, actually. PPU and CPU. So this is the, the CPU and this is the PPU. And the rest is a bit of logic and some small components. And I think this must be the famous lockout chip. This is branded as a Nintendo part. So um, they had a lockout chip so it was not that easy to produce pirated cartridges. And also I think this is one of the first examples for region lock that was implemented by using this chip. I think there's ways to um, circumvent it and probably I'm going to have to look at that at some point. But for this video, this is just a restoration kind of video, so I'm not really concerned with that. The power actually comes into this box, so I guess there's the rectification and stuff happening in there, probably. And here's my voltage regulation. That's just a regular 7805 just uh, stuck in this heatsink here which is also connected to the video and audio out on this uh, metal box. And here's the connection of the contacts that are here 
there's the connector where the cartridge actually plugs in and then it goes through all these metal conductors here and is soldered, probably soldered or stuck. No, it's just a contact, it's just a press fit, I guess. No wonder these have issues. So I'm going to take this whole part off, I guess. I wonder if we can actually slide, yeah, we can just slide it off. Okay, so this is actually the connector and here's another edge connector that just slides over that. So you have this edge connector and this edge connector to be points of failure, which these are actually, they get uh, messed up and dirty all the time and don't make good contact. So no wonder that's an issue with these consoles. And also a classic, one of the standoffs lost its head basically, <laughs> so it's just a chipped off piece of plastic that we can glue back on, I guess. So this should actually just come right off. And it does. And we see the back. So that's probably going to be the first thing I do to desolder this whole can here. There's contacts here. And then we can open it. And I'm going to replace the little capacitors on here, of course, as I do. Oh, and there's also a crystal oscillator here. Crystal. 26.601712. 26 megahertz. Supposedly running uh, faster than on the Commodore 64. It's a very similar processor. It's one of the uh, 6502 derivatives, I think. Let me solder this can. That's probably the first step I want to do. First of all, I want to uh, remove the screw here so we don't get that messed up. This is actually a separate part, okay, but it screws through to the can. So the can is adding as an additional heatsink, I suppose. Pretty nice, but this is just an extra part. Let's desolder this. And I'm actually adding some fresh solder to make it easier to desolder. Might have to set the desoldering station to a slightly higher temperature because of course a huge metal can like that just takes a lot of heat away from the actual spot you're soldering. It acts as a heat sink. <laughs> I'm using some extra flux here. And some solder wick to hopefully free these. Ah, there we go. Now we're freeing up things. Can see the pins move. This is less trivial than I thought, actually. <laughs> yeah, now we got everything loose, I think. There we go. So now, supposedly, we should be able to open this metal can. Backside of it. Which we are! Lots of small capacitors in there. For the RF modulator, for the most part, in this filter cap, I guess. And as usual, I'm going to put a list of capacitors in the video description. Probably there are different board revisions. Don't know if that applies to all the board revisions. I'm just going to put a list of the capacitors I replaced in there. So you can play along at home, basically, <laughs> if you so desire. And as you can see, I had to bend some of the capacitors slightly sideways and solder them in so we can still have the lid in here. I don't have low profile versions of the capacitors for all the values, so this is going to be better than before <laughs> anyway. Now for the voltage regulator. I'm going to put a 78S05 in here, which is a 2 ampere rated one. This should be 
one amp rated actually because it doesn't say anything special on here. So yeah, we're going to be fine with the two ampere rated one. Prefer to use those because they run a tiny bit cooler than the others, but could get away with just replacing this with the standard 7805 or even leaving it in because these are really reliable usually. But components this old, I'm always, yeah, I'm doing preventative maintenance. These can fail and if they fail, they usually fail in catastrophic ways, just giving out the input voltage which is higher than the output voltage uh, on the output pin so that would be destroying the system right away. I am going to screw the new one down before I solder so I have the correct position and I'm going to add some thermal compound to both this side and uh, on the back here so we get thermal conductivity between all the pieces of metal so the whole can becomes a giant heat sink for the regulator which I think is a good idea and I cleaned this before I think we can close up the can. I'm slightly cleaning it with some isopropanol because it's got some dirt on there. This should, in theory, still fit fine. Yes, it does. Backside. Okay, there's the correct way to do this, and it's this way can see by the little cutouts for these protruding bits. So now I'm, I just want to replace the remaining capacitors on the board. Electrolyte capacitors, uh, 1 microfarad 2.2 and 100. So that should be relatively easy. The polarity is thankfully marked on the board. So I'm going to reattach the can. There we go. So we got to a point where we can actually try if we get the correct voltages. I'm not going to put a cartridge in. For now, I'm just plugging in the power supply, which is basically just a transformer, so we should plug in the power switch. I'm also going to put a dab of contact cleaner in there and into the reset switch. Should at least plug this assembly in and it's uh, coded so you can't get the polarity wrong unless you try really hard. <laughs> Let's plug in and see if this actually produces the correct voltages. So first of all we should get 9 volts AC on the power supply, I think. 10.6 volts, that's fine. We should get 5 volts from the voltage regulator. We get 12 volts in and 5 volts out, so that's good. Okay, so it seems we don't have anything arriving at the power switch here. We have it arriving here. I'm switching this on, 12.9, 12.9, that's our 5. So we have stuff coming here, but there's no 5 on this connector, okay. I think what I want to do is to resolder these connections, maybe there's something that's not making proper contact or something. So we only have one of our voltages. Okay, I think that did the trick. Uh, we have all of our voltages and the power LED is now blinking, which supposedly means we don't have a cartridge in there, <laughs> probably. Let's try with the cartridge, I guess. So we now have a cartridge in. Let's see. Yes, okay, we got power LED. That's good. And the voltages are good too. So let's connect the monitor to it, I guess, and see if it works. 
Okay, cross your fingers, everybody. And there we go. And the output looks actually really crisp. So I think it wasn't a bad idea to recap this whole can. And these uh, connections, actually the, the connections on the PCB are on the flip side. So on the top side of the PCB, it's probably a good idea to let the solder flow so that it gets good contact there. Normally these holes are plated through, so you should have a good connection. Maybe I broke some of the connections in the um, through hole plating there while desoldering this, but it seems to work. Got away with it. Yep, it does still work. That's actually pretty nice to see. I really have to clean these controllers though. I think the contacts, it's pretty difficult to get uh, them to actually move. With the electronics, I think that's probably all I want to do. Uh, I kept it pretty much stock. So let's get into cleaning the case. So I guess it's time to take the controllers apart. Chef, six screws each, oh, quite a solid construction. Uh, and then give all the plastic parts a nice little bath in uh, soapy water. So here's what's inside. Nothing much at all, I guess. Yeah, it's just the usual carbon pads and uh, carbonized silicon on the other end, on the actual pads. There's one MC14021 chip in here that handles the output. Yeah, I'm going to give this uh, a wipe down with some contact cleaner and be very gentle on these contacts and the other parts are just going to go in soapy water. Ah, and some original 80s fluff. <laughs> So I just soaked the parts in some uh, water and silver bang, which actually works really well on plastics, for me at least. Usually used on floors and such. And uh, there are some scuff marks left here that one of these magic eraser sponges is just ideal for. Usually you get them off really well with these. Taking off just a tiny amount of plastic. This is basically a very mild abrasive. Um, you can also use baking soda actually as the abrasive and just use a regular sponge with the same results basically. This looks really well, look at this. It's already nearly gone. There we go. Of course you want to be careful with uh, printed on stuff. And I'm using a brush to clean all the little cavities on the cases. It usually works really well for me. But I'm using a toothbrush for the smaller parts. The water turned pretty yellow, so uh, there was quite some dirt on that. And while I wait for the case parts to dry, I'm just going to give these RF shields a little wipe down with some window cleaner and uh, yeah, microfiber cloth. They're not in really bad shape. A bit of dirt on here still. And these controller boards I'm gently going to wipe with some alcohol with the same microfiber cloth different spot you want to be extremely careful with these uh, printed carbon contacts because they easily wipe off and I'm going to coat this with uh, Teslanol T6 which is a mild contact cleaner and that also prevents corrosion and the cables also get treatment with some uh, window cleaner 
they feel a bit grimy actually. They put some long cables on that, that's actually pretty nice. But uh, yeah, ideal for sitting in front of a large TV set, I guess. So, clever thinking there, Nintendo. So, the case parts turned out rather nicely already. However, the front portion of this is slightly yellowed, so we are going to do some retro brighting on that. The rest of the case looks really nice and uh, probably people were screaming at the screen because I forgot to pop these black parts off. They're just screwed in from the inside. Um, I left the, the springs for the little hatch here in place deliberately because usually just cleaning them and then drying them afterwards doesn't hurt them. I'm going to take these out and do some retro writing on the rest. I need a smaller screwdriver for this. Ah, it's actually not a Phillips screw. Okay, and this is screwed through with this screw, I think. Okay, so actually this screw on the little spring-loaded hatch uh, is actually screwed through to this black part, so I'm just going to take off the hatch now, because Nintendo wants me to. And I'm going to go with some cling wrap and some 12% uh, peroxide cream. This is hydrogen peroxide, you've probably seen me doing this before, so I'm not going to bother getting into much detail on this one. Uh, and then I'm going to use a grow light because UV light and heat, the grow light is good at producing both and that speeds up the retro brighting process. And then we're going to just massage the cream around slightly. You want to, you want a very thin spread of this. And uh, the controllers, I think, don't even need any retro brighting at all. And the cling wrap is just so that uh, nothing evaporates too quickly. So I'm just going to do that for all the parts that need slight retro brighting. And I'll be right back. And of course I'm not going to retro bright the darker parts of this because, yeah. They probably have some yellowing actually, but it's just not visible. It's just literally just a thin layer you need for this to work. Very thin layer. And this is not toxic, but you don't want to get it on your hands because it can cause quite some chemical burns. Don't really want that. And I'm putting this stuff in this box that is lined with aluminum foil, aluminium foil, whatever you want to call it, uh, where the light from the grow lights should spread evenly. Then I'm going to put the grow light on top and I'm coming in every half hour or so and massage the cream around slightly so we don't get any streaking and it evenly retro brights and we're just going to let the magic chemical reaction happen. <laughs> So it's about five hours later, I think, and uh, did the massaging every half hour. And I think we're actually at a point where there's not much happening. Yeah, but there hasn't been much happening for the last two hours, maybe. So I think that's about all we can get out of this but it's definitely significantly better than before. So I'm just going to rinse these parts and we'll have a closer look at this. I think it turned out pretty nicely. 
still a bit slight tint of yellow there, but we're going to see. Here's how it turned out. And I think you can still see a slight tint of yellow there, but overall, I am pretty satisfied with this. Yeah, it looks all right. It definitely looks better than before. It's always amazing the results you get with retro writing, I think. So uh, I'm still kind of a fan of it, even though the yellowing is going to return slightly over time. Uh, let's try and fix the little cracks this has. And I noticed that it has a little crack here and it's missing a little here. So what I'm going to do is to use baking soda and super glue, which is an easy way of building up plastic pieces. I thought briefly about just cutting some of the plastic from the inside and melting it with acetone, stir it up and melt the plastic and then build up plastic in places. But there's virtual, virtually no place here where I can take away plastic without damaging the integrity of the case. I, I suppose I could drill in these pieces here that are covered by these black pieces, but we all know where drilling goes on this channel, uh, at least if you have followed my channel. So I won't go there with this. So what I'm going to do is just to add some super glue and some baking soda and that makes a very solid material actually. And I think then you can file it down afterwards. And just slowly build up some structure. And of course, it's not going to be the correct color, but I think I can live with that. It's hopefully still going to look better than before. So I've built up some funny looking structures here and now I'm going to use one of my nail files to file it down to the needed measurements and I hope it's going to look at least halfway decent in the end. <laughs> We're going to see about that. So not too bad. Um, I think the repairs I can actually file this down a bit more. Turn out rather nicely. So I went on and carved out the bits so the pieces of the case fit together. And I used a screwdriver and my little pointy bit. And uh, yeah, just some patience. Oh, nearly forgot the little broken off standoff here. And I'm going to use this Uhu Plast, which is basically acetone. So you uh, weld the plastic together. You uh, dissolve the plastic to an extent and then put it on there. And usually this gives a really strong bond. So I'm just going to put some on here. Then we put the piece on here. Yeah, there we go. And that sits there rather nicely. And this has to cure for a bit, so I'm just going, going to give it a half an hour or something. And then this should be strong enough to actually put the case together. <music> these buttons I'm just going to give a quick wipe they're not too bad I'm leaving them in place here
so yeah, my usual entanglement of cables here. But other than that, this should be a working console, I guess. Yeah, there we go. And it doesn't look half bad, actually. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Hope it was informative, maybe. And hope to see you all again on this channel. A special thanks to my Patreon supporters and the people who support me with the YouTube membership. Links are below. And yeah, I'm Jan Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye.